our westernmost province, it's an authentic example of Indian art carving by native artists who have learned the skill of their forefathers. Henry Hunt, a member of the Huachutl tribe, has learned to use native tools, axe, adze, and plane, from the late Chief Mungo Martin. Chief Martin, before he died, was to carve many a fine pole, reconstruct many others, and most important, pass on his knowledge to younger carvers. Working with Henry Hunt is another Huachutl, his younger brother, Tony. Although totem carving is known in many parts of the world, anthropologists and art critics agree it has reached its highest peak in British Columbia. These native carvers are among the few of the last living artists who are keeping alive a cultural asset to Canada which came close to death not much more than a decade ago. At that time, only one man could be found who had kept his skilled hand at the work he had learned from his father and which his father had learned from his father's father. He was Chief Mungo Martin of the Huachutls, a tribe noted for its peaceful learning and respect for tradition. But the totem pole is a symbol of a proud race, a memento of the nation's infancy, a monument to a rare native art, and a pure form of Canadiana.
I learned from our father, Henry Hunt, who was a master carver in Quagio culture and tradition. And I learned with our dad for just under 10 years before he passed away. And I've been carrying on this tradition with my sons for about 35 years. As we get older and things get rolling in your life, uh, you refine this art more and more and more as time goes on. And I believe that one day you end up being a master carver. I think you'd be a master in almost anything if you spent 35 years at it. right over by this there's two uh, blocks there Just straighten it out.
do you work with these tools on on a pole? Yep, these are the uh, these are your main tool for roughing out. This is a straight adz. It's called that because of the shape of the blade. There's no, it's flat and straight on the end. And that's a lip dance. Completely different. This one's for going with the grain. When I'm carving on this mask, it's going down the grain. And this one you go across the grain. This one you get lots of shape out of, but it's rough shape. This one's smooth and clean. It's all different types of them. Like say there's probably 10 ads is that you'll be using at any one time on a totem pole. Basically nowadays you start off with your chainsaws, right? Just to rough it out and give it shape, the basic shapes. Then you use your adzes until you can't use your adzes anymore, but it'll be really clean with your adzes. And then you just use your knives for the final touch-up. You don't really use your knives for much of the carving at all. It's all with the adzes and chisels. And then it's just the knives that do this. Do really just in the corners of the mouth and the eyes and things that you clean up with just the knife. But mainly, these are your right, these are the right tool. So you work for months with this tool? For months and months. They become like an extension of your hand, though. You can carve, carve along a line cleaner than most people can draw a line. And it's just uh, what happens because you use them so much. And if you get three or four guys working on a totem pole and they're all in beat to each other. I see where they got their music from way back in the old days. Totem poles nowadays, they're made to tell a story. Mostly it's all memorial totem poles for people's families that have passed away. And it represents each one of the grandparents and their main crests and each one of the uncle's main crests. And it's all about remembering and honoring the people that were here before us. In the old days, it was to say who you were. Now it's more about letting people know about how much you loved and respected your mom and dad and your, and your great grandparents and that they never be forgotten. Every family here has their family crests. And it, as an artist, you don't carve any crests if your family doesn't own them. And fortunately for the Hunt family is we own most quagul crests. There's a few that we don't, but every figure that we please to carve, we can carve it as we own it.
All through time as a quaggy old person, when it came to the point of having a potlatch or a feast, the chiefs, most of them, weren't carvers. So they had to go see those carvers and ask them to make their pieces for their potlatch. Otherwise, they wouldn't have had pieces for their potlatch. And they wanted them to be the most elaborate and beautiful and big, great pieces, finely carved. And if they didn't have a person to do that, they would never have been the big chiefs they were. So the, the artists actually, at some points, had more meaning than our chiefs did because the chiefs had to be humble and go see their artists. That's where you say goodbye to your, to your loved ones. That's where you pass on your loved ones that have passed on. You take their crests and their dances and their, their meaning and pass it down to the younger generation. And it continues the Quagul, Quagul name, Quagul traditions, culture. If we, if we don't pass it on, it stops. The pole in uh, Argentina was um, all Hunt family crests from Fort Rupert. And they wanted, our dad and our grandfather must have wanted people to know our family and where we were from. It was made by our brother, Tony, and our father, Henry. Our grandfather, Mangu, passed away in 1962. So there's a good possibility that Mangu might have had, a, had something to do with it, to even have helped for a while before things happened. But it was probably the last big pole made before Mungu passed away. I know that my brother David and I would have been running around back and forth on top of that pole while it was being made, because we would go down and visit Mungu and Dad while they were doing these totem poles, and we'd be playing on the top of the pole while they were carving on different parts of it. We just had to stay out of their way. But we got to play on them and go see them, and be a little bit a part of it anyway. To replace our, our dad's pole down in Argentina is a, it's the, the biggest thing ever in my life, to tell you the truth. I'm, I'm absolutely happy and honored and proud to be our dad's youngest son and to be able to do this for our family and for Argentina is, it's huge. I'm 
I, I can't wait to get going. I can't wait till that log's here and be able to strip that log and start laying the pieces out. It's going to be very emotional for our family and for me. I can't wait. It's going to be uh, the biggest thing I've ever done in my lifetime. To deal with the natural world, that'd be the bear and the wolf and the killer whale, the moon, the sun. Then there's the supernatural world, it'd be like the Dunaquat and the Bookless. It's not a religion, it's our beliefs but it isn't a religion. It's what we strive for to be as powerful as a killer whale, as powerful as an eagle. In the spiritual world, if you have a spiritual world, in the supernatural world, you're striving to be the thunderbird, the most powerful bird in the world. In the old days, you weren't allowed to have masks and totem poles, and you weren't allowed to speak your language. Um, our family never stopped. We had people, uncles, that actually went to jail for potlatching and owning masks and things back in the old days. Not that long ago, neither. But um, they were, uh, we still potlatched in Alert Bay. Most quagilts did. And it was because uh, Alert Bay was on the island. And uh, they potlatched when it was storms. 
and they had lookouts on the points to see if the police were coming to Alert Bay, but they'd have to fight the storm to get to Alert Bay. So they, uh, they potlatched during that time. And then when the potlatch was over, you had to hide everything again. Mainly, most likely, deny that it ever happened if you were asked about it. But they'd find out somehow. And there was family members that went to, uh, went to prison for that. There's probably now, today, maybe 550 quagilts living here. This territory is all about the village of Fort Rupert. The, it's called Takis in our, in our language. Uh, the quagilt people have been in this territory for between five and 10,000 years. And in this one bay here, there was between five and 10,000 quagilts here at the same time. That was maybe 100, and 100 years ago or so, 120 years ago. These beaches here are, are almost like our grocery store. There's our clams and our, and our crabs. Our herring pond is just right by Shell Island there. Our, uh, Salmon all come from these waters here, and uh, it's been inherited by our, from our families from before, from our grandfathers and our great-great-grandfathers and our grandmothers. And we're the caretakers of this land now as time goes on.
both sides? Yeah. Yeah. Another thing about the nature of Pwagyoth is that we live with nature. We never change our surroundings other than we used all natural building materials. We used every bit of the cedar tree, including the bark and the inside of the bark to make clothing and to make um, vessels that we could carry water in. And um, for ceremonial purposes, you'd have cedar bark skirts and cedar bark headdresses. Uh, every, every piece of the cedar tree was used. Clarity, is that all right? Yeah, a little bit. A little bit too close?
I just finished a 15-foot welcome figure. Uh, it was all painted and carved. Everything was finished on it. The next day, we were going to load it and move it to Vancouver. And uh, a buddy was sitting right there, a friend of mine was sitting right here. And he heard a bump at the window, and he looked, and the bear's nose was right on the window looking in the house. And he, when he moved, the startled the bear. So he jumped on top of the welcome figure and went across the top of the welcome figure, and one jump landed at the bottom 15 feet away, and then jumped off of there and went straight into the bush. But he left his claw marks in the eyes of the welcome figure and on the bottom of the feet right at the bottom of the feet where his claws had hit on there. So I phoned the person that I was supposed to be delivering the pole to and asked him if he wanted me to recarve his eyes and recarve his feet because of the claw marks. And he said, uh, no, he says, I leave that on there because the bear came to visit my, my totem pole. So we left it. So it still has claw marks on it down in Vancouver. <laughs> yeah. That's pretty good. Nice to see a bear.
Right there, perfect. What's it sitting on it? Well, oh, that's just two pieces of wood, that's all. Eh? Abajo está bien. <coughs> Eh, eso también estaba incluido. Eso estaba incluido. Creo que quedó bastante bien. ¿Eh? ¿Qué vas a poner la máquina para qué? Guarda los clavos, eh. Ah, no, pare, pare, ¡Eh! ¡Eh! Pará, pará. Dijo que iba a pasar la otra grúa. No, no, seguro. No, pero iba a poner para des deslindar, iba a traer la... Iba a poner la otra grúa para deslindar. Sí, me parece que sí. Para que habría que... La, la nariz tiene que mirar para allá, Carlos, ¿eh? Para allá la nariz, más para allá. Pará, pará, pará. No sé si lo va a girar, ¿eh? Ahí. Sí. Un poquito más todavía. Ahí. Dale, dale. Él lo midió también, ¿eh? Carlos lo midió recién. Me... Pará, 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 un cachito. ¿Eh? Sí, sí, sí. Sí, va a tocar contra el piso, me parece. ¿eh? Me parece que va... A ver, me di cuánto tenemos, a ver si tenemos... No, no, levanta, está, está haciendo mucha presión. Está haciendo mucha presión, decir que la levante un pelito. Ahora sí. Bájalo ahora. Ahí está, ahí está. Poquito más, poquito más. Ahí, bájalo ahora. Bájalo ahí. ¿Para dónde? Dale así ahora, ahí, dale. Guarda la jeta, ¿eh? Acá, empujarle un poco, acá abajo, bajo de esa, 
La, la planchuela, pará. ¡Pará! No, metela desde acá, mirá. Dame desde acá. Y ahí va más fácil. Ahí está el pelo, ¿no? ¿Qué? Eugenia, está bien, ¿no? Dale. Para falta la otra, ¿eh? falta la otra, empaná. ¿eh? Está bien. Para que lo tenemos que traer para acá, Carlos, ¿eh? Algo va a ir, ¿viste? Pero que lo tenga colgado. Acá se trabó, para, me parece. Acá no se trabó. Guardá los tornillos que se van a perder y no tenemos otro. Aguantar la, a guardar la tuerca. ¿Qué te pasó, Carlos?